Okay, we are with Steve Sareski. And the thing I like about Steve is that I feel like Steve just tells it like it is, or at least he just speaks his mind as he sees it. So Steve, don't hold back on this. We want to hear the real Steve's views. Do you ever hold back? Is like, do you hold back on stuff or no? Uh, not really. I've held back on on f bombs and stuff in the past. No, uh, you can I swear keep, here. Yeah, we try here. to keep that to a minimal. So, do you? But, okay. Uh, on my on my views, not so much. I mean, I try to. Stay, I don't know about you, but like, you know, I'm still obviously very active on the real estate side. So I have to kind of stay a little bit out of the politics. Um, I don't know. I feel like you dip into the politics. I do. I do a bit, but I try not to express, I try not to push my views. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't feel like you're pushing them. I feel like you just share some, some stuff. Okay. So for those people, for anyone who does not know you, what do you like to be known as the co-host of the loony hour, Steve Uh, from BC, Steve from BC. You know, it's funny. I usually just, I usually just say Vancouver realtor just cause I'm like, well, at least they know what I do. Um, but honestly, yeah, I feel like I'm definitely more of like a content creator, um, investor, real estate investor, co-host of Looney hour. I guess I wear a lot of hats, but, um, yeah. And I so mean, actually, so you're bringing up an interesting point. A lot of people who listen to this are going to be in the greater Toronto area. If someone is looking to, to do something out there, they can, if they wanted to reach out to you, what kind of real estate do you help people with everything? Or is there like a segment of real estate that you like to focus on who would be your client? I'm kind of everything. I mean, I live in the city of Vancouver. So I, I mean, I try to keep most of my business in the core. Um, you know, I'm not, don't really want to drive 45 minutes to an hour out. Um, so, but pretty much anything in the core, we, we, yeah, we work with investors. I tend to actually get a lot of end users. Um, I mean, I think the investment numbers in Vancouver are becoming very, very hard to justify. So I think that's been a natural shift to more and more end users, particularly over the last couple of years. So what do you, okay. So let me just start there. So where, where, where are we in your view? And I don't know if you want to talk about British Columbia or Canada, Ontario, whatever for investment real estate. Like, where do we go from here? Because rates have made it difficult for everyone across the country. I know there'll be pockets of the country, yeah. different provinces that are going to be easier, but where do we go from here? Are you expecting a change in rates that might change numbers or no, you're not expecting a rate? Where do you think we go? Um, that's a good question, man. Honestly, <laughs> uh, the rate thing. The, the, yeah, get, out know, the, get out the crystal ball. The rate thing you. is like the rate thing has really been tough. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll full disclosure. I got the rate. So I got the rate call like wrong in at the end of 2021 coming into 2022. So like my view is basically maybe it's somewhat similar to yours, which is like the monetary system is broken. There's way too much debt. They might need to raise rates, but can we really sustain higher rates given the debt loads, not just in Canada, but everywhere. And so I was like, yeah, they might raise, you know, a few couple bait, you know, two, three, maybe four times. I was not of the view that we'd get 500 basis points of, Oh, of I was with here. dude. We were with like, I would be with you. I was, so, I remember when someone's telling me that bank of Nova Scotia came out with that early report saying they're going to raise rates nine times. Yeah. Um, and I was like, no, like, listen, I've been in real estate a long time. They're not going to do that. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. No, yeah, you, weren't I, the, you weren't the only one. I got some egg on my face for that one. But I think yeah. to that point, though, it's like, okay, so they exceeded that, right? We're 500 basis points higher. And I think a lot of people would be surprised that like real estate, at least here in Vancouver in particular, is held up really, really well. I mean, like... Okay, so yeah, why why do you think it has? Because I think that has been the most shocking thing to to me as well. Why, yeah, why do you think- Inventory. Um, I, I think that everyone was of the view that you were going to get like a wave of foreclosures. Everyone's just going to start dumping properties. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we've had the opposite. We've had just like, you know, like last year we had like, I think the first six months of last year, we had 20 year lows and new listings every single month. And so there's just not a lot of product on the market today. We're starting to see a bit more on the condo side, but like single family detached, man, there's nothing, there's nothing for sale. So it's like, is a seller. It's like, yeah, rates are high, but like you're the only seller on the market. Why are you going to drop your price? You got no competition. So the prices have held up really, really well. I still think there's probably more pain to come. Like, I don't know if we're out of the weeds just yet, but so that's, that's number one. I've more recently been like, okay, I was kind of the view that at some point, you know, you get some bad 
bad debts, uh, some defaults, businesses going under, rates would come back down. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I still think that's going to happen, but like, it's just been so resilient. And so now I'm just like, I don't know, like, are we just going to have, that be, wouldn't that be the natural thing though? Like it holds on so long that we all think, oh shit, I guess it's not happening. And then they cut rates. Yeah. You could, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we're all to the point where like, oh, I guess they're really, I like, I, I, I don't know if you listened to this one Luke Roman press and pitch podcast came out like, I think two weeks ago or so we're recording this in like, uh, mid, mid March, later part of March. Um, and he said, uh, I like Luke, I like Luke stuff a lot. You're familiar with yeah. Luke Roman? Yeah, I subscribed to his report, okay. actually. Okay, yeah, yeah, I love his yeah. reports, yeah. So uh, on that podcast, he was saying where he thinks people are going to be shocked are, is going to be the narrative is going to change that they're actually going to have to raise rates because inflation is just not coming down enough. Mm -hmm. But when they actually cut them later this year in the face of higher than normal or higher or relatively higher inflation, that will be the moment where everyone is like, oh shit, they don't <laughs> care about the inflation. They just care about saving the treasury market. We're going to lower rates and that will be the aha moment for the market and risk assets, things like real, real estate because of the lower rates will drift higher perhaps. Yeah. So, so I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely like to sort of unpack that a little bit further with you because like my view is, is I, yeah, I subscribe to a lot of Luke's views uh obviously don't agree with all of them but i think that you know you look at the numbers on like the u.s treasury for example and it's like you these levels of interest rates they can't be sustained um you are running into fiscal dominance uh issue and so yeah i i just wonder you know people always ask me like oh vancouver real estate vancouver real estate you know the prices are so high who's buying how are you buying it's like i don't know about you but i mean i look at it and it's like you know we've done like yeah, we've done a lot of transactions over the years. And so it's, it's the people, I don't have any, just first say time it, home, just say it. I feel like you're holding something there. I don't just have any it. first time home buyers that like are making it on their own. There's nobody mm -hmm. that's like saving yeah. like the traditional sense of like, Oh, you work hard, you yeah. save your money. Then you get a down payment. You buy a house. Like, nobody does that. It's all this wealth transfer. It's this inflated asset parents' house went up from $500,000 to 3.5 million. They take half a million dollars of equity off the table. They give it to their kids to buy into the housing market. The kids might have a very average job, but because they're putting, you know, on a $2 million house, they're getting a million dollars from of gift money. Like it, it changes the math. And so it's become kind of this feudalistic state where unless you're already have assets and you're in this asset world or you're already your parents are on the housing ladder, you're kind of good. And if you're not, it, it doesn't even matter. Like I've got clients that are doctors that make 350, 400,000 mm -hmm. bucks mm -hmm. a year. They're just technically in the top 1% of income earners and they can't save their down payment because they're paying, you know, of the 400 grand, they're paying 200 K to taxes and you're paying five grand a month for your rent. And it's just hard to actually save hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars for a down payment. So you think then, uh, and I don't want to lead you or answer for you, but are, are you then kind of hinting that the real estate market stays flat, trends down longer term? I think that just just because I think it's, it's so just a, I think it's just a store. I think it's just a store value. It's just become an it's just become an asset class. It hasn't become like shelter. It's become an asset class, which is like if you look at Vancouver real estate and you and you denominate it in gold, right? Which mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 real money. It's not a fiat currency. You denominate Vancouver real estate prices in gold, and the prices have been flat. They've been down. They've been actually trending down for the last like fifteen years. Mm -hmm. So, like, despite like everybody talks about, like, oh, you know, like we had this huge rip in 2015, 16. We had a huge rip again during the pandemic. Prices are completely out of control. But it's like, well, if you go actually denominate them in gold, I mean, they it's telling you a completely different story. Um, and so I just think that's just this massive debasement. Um, you know, I think it's the end of this long-term debt super cycle. And I, and while you might have corrections here and there, I still think real estate, uh, is, is just the prices are just a reflection of a failing currency. That's all I think it is. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you. Exactly. So then what, what like, 
Well, that sounds like such tinfoil hat conspiracy. No, no right? not, but it doesn't to me. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I like, I hear when people say that, when you say these things, but if you just look at the data, like with the yeah. data that you just shared, when you, you were sharing uh real estate prices denominated in gold, I don't know. That's yeah. not tinfoil hat to me. That's just data. Like you're just showing it on a chart. Like, here's what it is. Totally. Like, and the debasement isn't conspiracy either to me because I can just look at the Federal Reserve's asset sh uh, balance sheet or I can look at Canadian M2, whatever mm -hmm. you, you, you pick your metric, whatever you want to look at, and you could see what's happening. Canadian M2 is going up. I just ran the numbers. The compound annual growth rate of Can Canadian M2 since 2008 is 7.99%. So like 8% compounded yeah. annually. So like basically the price of real estate, price real estate yeah, exa yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I don't even think it's tinfoil hat to say it anymore. Like I think it used to be, but now it's just like, I don't know. The currency is getting debased at 8%. Prices of real estate tend to go up 8%. It's like, are they really going up in real terms to your point? Not yeah, really. that's like, the thing. And it's, you know, and yeah, I think it's just, yeah, it's kind of sad to see. You see this like ongoing, like wealth divide, which is getting larger and larger and larger. And so coming coming kind of full circle is like governments, like locally anyways, like, you know, I look at the provincial government here in BC, um, <laughs> everyone's trying to tinker around the edges to like fix housing. And it's like, well, you, you weren't going to get political. You weren't going to get political, Steve. Remember? You oh, said we're diving into it now. <laughs> uh, so everyone's t everyone's like tinkering around the edges, right? Like, oh, little policy here, like Airbnb ban, empty homes tax, um, you know, a speculation tax. And so they're creating all these like little policies around the fringes, but they haven't fixed like the big underlying problem, which is like this just ongoing debasement um, that is only going to escalate in the next crisis, which maybe we're getting closer to, but, uh, and so what's, what's more concerning from that angle is, you know, you asked me about like the investment side in BC. Well, I think it it is becoming a harder investment thesis simply because the government is getting more and more desperate to rein this in, or they're getting more and more desperate to make it look like they can, they're, they're going to fix the problem, which mm. is the rhetoric now is coming out against land. And it's been, the writing's been on the wall for a, for like four or five years minimum, which is you have this massive wealth accumulation, the haves between the haves nots. The government is now pointing the finger and saying the investors are the bad people. Mm -hmm. We need to get rid of the speculators, right? So they brought in, like I said, a speculation tax. Like, what is it? What, like, is, and then now they've got, they just brought in, the BC government just brought in a flipping tax. So if you buy and buy and sell a home within two years, you're going to pay upwards of 20% of your profits to the BC government in addition to what you're already paying CRA. So the new scapegoat is like the investors. Oh, it's the investors that broke the housing market. It's not, you know, the massive population growth, the undersupplying of housing or the debasement of the currency. It's, it's these bad investors, which I think the investors are just playing in the arena that they've been placed in, which is they're just looking to basically protect their hard, hard working savings, right? And the smart investors can see the ongoing debasement that that is happening and, and real estate's just a store of value. And so I think that the policy direction, I think in Canada is con going to continue to get more antagonistic, I think towards investors. Okay, so I'm not going to hold you to any interest rate decisions, but when I mentioned Luke Roman's comment that he thought interest rates will be cut this year, um, and that might shock everyone because inflation won't be down to 2% and they'll still do it anyway. Do you think maybe that they don't cut rates? And because you could stimulate the economy in a different way, like you could hold rates high, send everybody checks in the mail or SERB checks or deposit money into everyone's bank account. Like you can debase or stimulate in different ways if you really wanted to. So you could keep rates high. And then that way you could say, yeah, look, we're keeping everything under control and the bad real estate investors, we're not making it easy for anyone anymore because rates are high. Maybe if you're a first time home buyer, you get a special lower rate or some crazy federal election kind of promise, or we do 40, 50 year amortizations for first time home buyers or you know whatever keep rates high but just like mail people checks for everything you can think of under the sun is it do you think that's possible or no you think later this year rates are going to be cut and i'm not trying to corner I, yeah, you by no, the way I still, Steve. So, i'm yeah, just so curious I, I still think rates will be cut in canada um i can't say the same for this like it feels like the data in the u.s is clearly holding up a lot better than canada which really shouldn't be surprising given like you look at household indebtedness in canada versus the u.s it's a completely different picture obviously you got 30-year fixed rate mortgages there 
here you got, you know, variables and at most you get a five year fixed term. So we are way more sensitive to this. So I still think like, I think where it's going to get really interesting is if the U S it doesn't cut rates this year, maybe they cut, you know, once, um, Oh shit. That's, and then, and then we, I, yeah, I see where you're going. And if you're, if you're the, if you're the bank of Canada, like I think the bank of Canada wants to and needs to get rates down. And I'm just, if the fed only cuts once, like, what are we going to do? Are we going to cut five times if the fed cuts once <laughs> and just, so I, I shouldn't laugh at that, but yeah, you know, I know. I know. yeah. If you're holding Canadian dollars, oh, I mean, that's, God. that's going to be a sad day. Um, okay. But, but the U S wouldn't you think the U S is going to cut just because there's a U.S. election, and they want the economy to be kind of humming. But I guess to your point, you're saying the U.S. economy is humming. So they don't really need to do the cut. For yeah, I wouldn't, your... I don't think, I'm not saying like, I don't know. I mean, there's so many ways that you can kind of like, yeah. everybody looks at the data a little bit different, finding little points to like fit their narrative. But yeah, I, think yeah. as, I think as a whole, I think people can say that the U.S. economy is holding up okay. And so there's not a whole lot of compelling reasons like, you know, the S and P's at record highs, you know, crypto surging, Nvidia, like there's, there's feels like there's a lot of like speculation and froth still in the markets where it's like, I don't know if there's a lot of compelling reasons to actually be cutting rates in the States. I think Canada is becoming a different picture, right? You know, real GDP per capita has been declining for six consecutive quarters. Um, you know, the housing market, the levels of, of rent. Debt. Yeah. The levels of indebtedness. I think that there's a lot of Canadians that are struggling. And so I think we need to get rates down faster, but we might be stuck if the fed doesn't go a whole lot, which I don't think the fed is going to. So basically coming back full circle is like, what if you only get two cuts or maybe even, yeah, maybe even three from the BOC this year. Does that actually provide a lot of help? So you're taking to take, mm -hmm. you're going to take someone's variable rate mortgage which today is call it 6.2 and you're going to bring it down to five and a half. I, I'm not convinced that's going to be a, the release valve that everyone's hoping for. Hmm. It's going to be interesting because I think a lot of people in the real estate community, at least in Ontario saw the pause back last spring and it definitely spurred the real estate market. People were like, Oh, they're not raising anymore. Like in the real estate market, kind of ran. Yeah. So I think the real estate community is at least thinking a, ha a quarter point or a half point is like, here we go. The rates are coming and it's back game on. And to your point, to unleash the animal spirits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think, they, I think, I think it would, I think it would, like, I think we've seen it even this year, like coming into this year, like activity was pretty strong in January. Cause everyone's like, Oh, the bank yeah. is going to cut. Yeah. I think the initial, like coming into this year, the market was pricing in five cuts five cuts in the BOC. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, if you get five, the market's going to do probably pretty good. Now we're down to three cuts this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're slowly being priced out. And like I said, maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's only two cuts this year from the bank of Canada. And I just don't think that might get an initial spur of activity on that first cut. But like, I think people are going to zoom out eight months from now and realize that variable rate mortgages are still at five and a half percent. You brought up an interesting term. We were actually going to record a video soon called modern feudalism. And just basically talking about like, Hey, if you don't own some form of property very soon, or your family doesn't already, you're kind of priced out. You kind of, you have to work for an income. The income doesn't keep up with the, the asset inflation through debasement of the currency. And that's what it is. And, you know, welcome to Canada. And then you brought up the term, which I didn't expect you to bring up with just feudalism. So you, you think similar thoughts that like you either have yeah, your property do, or I, you don't. For sure. And I think there's, I do worry about like the politics that are involved in a world like that, because I just think it's going to get nasty and you're going to have huge, um, political swings on both sides. Um, I think, you know, it's funny, like it sounds not, I mean, it's not funny, but it's like the RCMP put out a report like two weeks ago to like all their members basically being like, we, these are the risks moving forward over the next five to 10 years. And one of them was like a growing wealth divide from a lot of people being priced out and never having a, even the hope of possibility of, of, of obtaining home ownership. And she's like, if that's like the internal report that's going around the higher ups of the RCMP, it's oh, like, it shit. shouldn't be that hard for like everyone else to kind of figure out that, you know, clearly we've reached a point of no return.
Okay. So then is it just a mindset change? I guess we need in Canada. Like I think when we were talking to Daniel Foch a couple months ago and he brought up a good point. He's like, Hey, you know, in Switzerland, everyone thinks Switzerland's a great place to live. 50% of the people there are renters. Mm -hmm. So like, is Canada just going through its moment where, you know, my parents came here in the sixties um, and you could work your, in it was an era where your income was decent relative to asset prices. There wasn't not that much debasement happening relative to today's world. So you could save up some money, you could buy a house. Is it just, we're going through a change and that's what, where people rec where people like you see that change. So it gets frustrating that in maybe 20 years, it's just going to be like, yeah, you know, half the population rents, it's normal. And maybe it's just getting to that point is a bit frustrating for some of us. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's kind of my view personally, as I think like the home ownership rates clearly peaked. I think it'll continue to move lower and you know, the government's clearly trying to push, um, secured rental housing through CMHC, uh, very favorable financing to get rental housing built, give people an alternative to, to home ownership. And so I think that's the direction that it's going. You know, I guess if I was to like speculate and say, well, is there anything that could reverse that? maybe it's declining population at some point or, or is it, you know, AI and 3d printing of homes that allow, you know, housing costs to, yeah. to moderate or come down over. Have you seen those videos of the 3d printing of homes where they're printing a whole home? Yeah, it's crazy. I was reading an article. So I was reading an article in Bloomberg like last week and they were talking about, uh, so one of the largest developers in the U S publicly traded they had partnered up with this new like ai 3d printing startup and they're building a hundred house subdivision in like texas or something but it's all going to be with 3d printed homes so it's like it's it's like um it's a starting point i mean it's a long ways away from like mm -hmm. mass adoption or coming to canada but i think that's potentially the future of of home building is some form of like AI operated, you know, I mean, you, you see it now, right? I mean, we actually got some couple companies coming up in Vancouver. Now they're starting to build more housing in warehouses. You know, you build, mm -hmm. you build the walls and, yeah. and everything in the warehouse in a, in a dry condition, you can shave off three months on your building time right there. What do you think, um, does Canada's attractiveness as a place for new immigration then change over the next 10 years, do you think? Or relative to the rest of the world, Canada, you you believe still is going to be an attractive place because we're such a small population base relative to a lot of places that, you know, on a per capita basis, we'll still get a lot of immigration here. Do you I think feel that like it probably, yeah, I think it probably still will like attract a lot more immigration. I think, you know, you see Canadians that are frustrated and like some, some leaving and going to yeah. the U S and talking about how bad it is here. And I get the frustration, but I think when you kind of put it into perspective of, you know, an immigrant coming from a third world country or, you know, a dictatorship somewhere yeah. else, yeah, like <laughs> you really can't compare yeah. the two. No, so like, I think you're yeah. still going to have like pretty, Agreed. pretty rapid population yeah. growth here. Has your thinking on your long-term, cause you know, you're, you're relatively really young. Um, has your long-term thinking changed on where you will be in 20 years or, because I know when I was your, like I, when I was 25 or 30, I didn't ever think I would have the thought like, Oh, am I going to live in Canada my whole life? Yeah. Not? Like I never thought I would even entertain that thought. Like I would never have that thought. And now it's, you know, more and more people, you mentioned some people are leaving Canada. I've had the thought myself like, Oh, I don't know. Like, am I really going to be here in like 10 years? Or maybe I'll just be here a little part of the time. Where are you with that? Are you thinking about that at all? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, um, I was probably similar to you. Like I never, never really crossed my mind Yeah. up until really like the last couple of years, I think more just, yeah. just seeing, because I think now you have to be so appreciative of like politics. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. you know, think about this is like, if you have all of your assets, like, let's just say you like your, most of your like net worth in your portfolio is in like Canadian real estate. So, you know, you've levered up, you've taken it all, but like at the end of the day, like the value of that portfolio is really just like, dictated by the governance of the country, right? So it's like, if it goes to hell in a handbasket, I mean, it doesn't matter if you have eight houses, like they're not really gonna be worth a whole lot. You know, if you wanna sell and cash out and move that to a different currency, um, if you don't have competent government here, then 
yeah, you might be rich in your own country, but you're not rich on a global basis, which I think is more important for most people, right? Like when you think about it, it's like, if you want to go on a vacation to the U S yeah. today, it's, it's yeah. really, it's a lot more expensive today than it was three, four, five, seven years ago. Um, and, you know, I was in Mexico like earlier this year and it's like, man, like I remember going to Mexico like seven, eight years ago and it was dirt cheap, cheap. but now, yeah. like, you know, like the peso is like, I know is, is who would have ever thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we're so the, it's like, we're, yeah, the, we're the peso. We reverse roles. <laughs> yeah. I've started looking at it more and more on like a relative global basis. I mean, I, I know you guys are like long Bitcoin. I mean, I yeah. certainly share a, a lot of similar views there too. Cause it's like, Hey, you know what? You've, you've got this like little, like, basically usb stick and if if shit ever hits the fan you can just put it in your pocket and and jet somewhere else and and bring a million bucks with you are do you, is canada like one election away like do you think a change in government and not asking you to get political really but like could it just a change in government here you think change the path we're on really quickly or do you think the path is kind of set for canada as far as maybe its currency and housing um i mean i think that like I'm whole, I think one federal election could change a lot of things. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so like, I think most like uh, probably the vast majority of Canadians right now. Yeah. But I just also feel like the issues, the problems that we have here are not going to be solved by like one new yeah, prime minister or one new party, like four years of one party. Um, I think you can slowly start to undo a lot of like, I think that, I mean, like regardless of one's political view, I think the economic mismanagement over the last 10 years has been really incredible um it's it's pretty bad steve why do you like i don't i don't understand where your views come from you have a pretty cohesive view context framework you're operating from in the way you describe real estate canada the economy where does that all come from i don't get it like at your age why do you know all this stuff this is something your family <laughs> talked about no because most uh, no, people man, at 32 I, are not talking like you're talking so i don't yeah. i don't i don't get you i'm trying to figure um, you out where does this come from this is something you just dove into in your 20s so yeah i mean pretty much so i basically i mean i've always been like business minded i've always been entrepreneurial i've always sort of maybe, I don't know, question. I've always had a curiosity, like a natural curiosity. And so, um, yeah, I got into the business at 22, but like, you know, I got into the business cause I think I'd like at 20 years old, I read like rich dad, poor dad. And I was like, Oh, like real estate. Like I got to get out of this. Like, you know, I got to work for myself, be entrepreneurial, got into that. I remember again, I got into real estate housing market was starting to rip higher as, 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 as I just got into it in like 2015 and everyone was like, oh, it's just like supply and demand, right? You hear they all like all the yeah, realtors yeah. in the industry. It's like, <laughs> it's supply and demand. But I was like, man, like, well, like what's, what's driving the demand? And then you get down this rabbit hole, right? You're like, well, like there's this like currency devaluation that's happening in China and there's massive outflows happening over there and interest rates are super low. And, you know, Larry Fink of BlackRock's telling you to buy Vancouver condos. There'll be a great store of value. And it's like, well, why is he saying that? And like... And so, you know, you just kind of go down the rabbit hole. Um, obviously, you know, I pay a lot of, of money over the last, over the number of years for subscriptions. I was one of the, I feel like I was one of the early people in like Real Vision. Okay. I'm not sure if people are familiar with oh that. Oh my gosh. I think I saw you on Real Vision. Yeah. yeah I've been I've on totally... there a few times. Okay. Okay. Holy yeah. shit. I totally forgot about that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was an early subscriber and I was just like, man, like, but like they, when they first started, they had like two or three interviews a week. That's all he did. So like okay. way less content, but like super high end, like 4k recording. They would fly, they would fly from New York to like UK to film one interview. And then they would go back to New York. So like they would basically just be like sitting down with like one, like macro hedge fund guy and they'd be interviewing him and it'd be like an hour long. And like a lot of that, I was like, man, these guys are like wicked smart. And like a lot of it was initially going over my head, but I just kind of kept sitting down every week and just like learning and understanding like the system. And huh. then kind of obviously used a lot of that and formulated my own opinions over the years too. 
And then how did you get the confidence to, I, sorry, I'm, I'm taking you all over the place yeah. now, so I apologize. It's just, you're a pretty interesting character. Um, how did you get the confidence to start doing your YouTube videos? Because for um, any, anyone listening, I think what's interesting to me watching Steve is that he has the ability to, or he has had the ability to build an audience and he's done that by sharing content in his views. And to me, most people are petrified to do that. You know, yeah. you, most people don't have the immunity to criticism that I feel that you have. And so like, how did you step into that first? Cause was it YouTube videos where you really yeah, started no, to share? Good, that's a good question. So I started, I uh, started, um, so again, obviously being newer into the real estate industry when the market was really taking off, like, I was like, well, how do I, how do I build a business? Right? Like I don't have, I don't have unlimited marketing dollars to do like thousands of mail outs and, and hope that it pays off. I was like, listen, like I'm a young guy. Um, nobody in the Vancouver real estate market seems to have like a website with a blog. Like, cause it was like nobody. So I just started blogging about like, I think we were in a bubble at the time. Uh, so I started kind of blogging about the Vancouver real estate bubble. Um, that started getting picked up by all these media sources. Cause I was the only guy that was like amalgamating okay, got it. <laughs> data. I was like putting all these charts together and I was like, here's like the chart on like house flipping and 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 so i started putting all this data together it got picked up and then i actually had like a colleague of mine that was like man you need to like get on youtube and like just film yourself and i was like i kind of like brushed it aside but about yeah i eventually took him up on that advice and didn't really pay off for a couple of years but <laughs> just kept doing one every single week at the same time and um yeah, it just took off. And I mean, I think over time you just kind of build thick skin. Um, it doesn't matter who you are. You can be the best person in the world, the smartest person in the world. And there's always going to be someone that disagrees with you or doesn't agree with your views and thinks you're an idiot. And so and you it, just brush it aside. How, yeah. And you were just naturally able to brush it aside. Like people that holds uh, everyone back. <laughs> Steve, you're saying that like you just brush it aside. That holds everybody back. No, I mean, I definitely think like there's definitely times where like it gets to you, it gets under your skin a bit, but like, what are you going to do about it? I mean, like if someone's taking the time to, to, to like log into YouTube, write a nasty comment, like, are they really like, what kind of mental state are they in? Yeah. Like it. if I, I don't know about you, but like, if I watch a piece of content and I disagree with that, I usually just go, yeah, I think this guy's an idiot. Click, yeah. exit. <laughs> I don't like log in and start commenting and like <laughs> totally. Well, yeah, I know a few people who do, but yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. I agree. I don't. Yeah. Usually I'll comment if I agree with someone, I'm like, Oh shit. Wow. Like that yeah. was pretty awesome. What, the way you laid that out, you know? Um, but yeah, I won't comment to disagree with somebody. It's like someone I'll have someone that like, I have some of these guys that will like watch, they like literally watch every show every week and every week they leave like, a comment being like, this guy's an idiot. I'm like, but you're still watching. I was like, every week you're here watching, commenting, and then telling me how much of an idiot I am. It's like, it's, it's an how interesting did, concept. How did that transition to the loony hour? Did you, um, you know, your co-host on the loony hour, did the, you guys all know each other before or yeah. did you get yeah. together? Did they see you doing your, like, was there a natural transition to that? How did that emerge? Uh, yeah, no, it's a good question. I, so yeah, getting back to real vision earlier. Um, so I was on real vision and then my, one of my co-hosts, Keith, he's a money manager in Halifax. He was, he got picked up by real vision cause he was writing a lot of like long form reports about what's happening in Canada, the macro environment. And so he was on real vision and then real vision was like, Hey, you two should do like an interview together. Like like Steve, you interview Keith about like what's happening in Canada. And so we did that. It got like really well received. We then did another one, like six months later, feedback was super positive. So him and I were just like, Hey, make, maybe we should like start a podcast. And, um, and so we just, yeah, we started a podcast and our third co-host there, Rich, um, we didn't really know him and Keith and him had, had met maybe once or twice and Rich reached out to me. I was like, Hey, I heard you guys are starting a podcast. Can I join? Can I be a part of it? And like Keith and I were like, dude, I don't know how to say no to this guy. Like, <laughs> like we're both like super nice. Like we're the typical Canadian person. That's like, you don't want to be rude to someone. And so we just didn't have the heart to say no. 
And uh, oh, I ended, feel like it's worked out for you guys. Yeah, it ended up working out. So I'm glad we uh, I'm glad we didn't say no. He's been like a really good addition. You know, a guy with like hedge fund experience data geek he yeah because he puts up. all the charts together right he puts a ton yeah. of, i feel like he puts a ton of good charts out yeah okay a ton of good charts yeah super smart guy you know he's yeah pretty young guy but um yeah he and he just loves markets right i mean like all three of us just love markets i love like figuring out how the world works yeah, and yeah. like how money shifts and like i've always just been fascinated by like i've always been fascinated about like how to get wealthy and like how to keep wealth and like being able to like pass it down to like the next generation. Like, you know, you see these people that have like these massive like real yeah. estate holdings and then just like they set up like their kids and like the, and the kid and the generation after them. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny. Like, you're touching on a point that a lot of our clients talk to us about, like, you know, creating a legacy and passing on an asset base. And I have a 22, a soon to be 22 year old son and an 18 year old daughter. So if they're listening to this, they're probably just going to shake their head, but I always find, I always struggle with that because sometimes I think if you set up your kids with any sort of meaningful estate, I don't know if you're robbing them of the suffering <laughs> that yeah. they need to build the character to turn into the person that I would hope they continue to evolve into. And I, I just sometimes struggle with that. So when I meet with some clients who are looking really proactively to set up this estate and pass properties down with insurance policies to pay the tax, you know, on the estate when they pass away and to leave all this stuff, sometimes I might be the asshole in the room because I'm more like, and Steve, I, I'm not trying to say don't do what you're doing. No, I mean, yeah, I I, you. I just, you're, you're just touching on a point that seems to be coming up with a lot of clients right now. And I, sometimes I'm like, ah. Like, do you, yeah, just... you see like a lot of there's it's interesting. There's like a, there's like data on it. I can't, I can't remember where I read it. I've read it a few times, though, where it's like. Eventually, there's always one person in the family, in the generation, whether it's like one generation or two or three or four generations afterwards, that ends up blowing the family. Just, and, yeah, and, like uh, for, we're not talking like a couple million all... bucks. We're talking like a massive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars that someone along the lines just comes in and screws it all up. And I think I've also seen some people have adult children that are waiting for their inheritance. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess just I'm conflicted on the whole thing. So when you figure it out, just let me know because uh, yeah, I my, think ki my kid's future depends on what you figure out, Steve. So yeah, send them well, we'll <laughs> trial and error. We'll see. I shouldn't say that. Yeah. And I shouldn't say that my kid's future is solely on their shoulders. That's uh, that, that's, uh, that's, I think you I just think, have to but... like teach like good money principles and yeah, agreed. I mean, I guess the challenge is making sure that like they're like, yeah, they don't become like super entitled and and have no work ethic. Agreed. Um, no, I I, I, think... I strongly believe in suffering. I tell both my children that like I want them to suffer, and I think they think I'm joking. Like, Dad, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, like you need to suffer in your young adulthood because you need to build character. That's what's going to carry you through hard times in life. And I I've... think they they literally look at me like because I'm very serious when I talk about this, um, but I am serious about it. It's... <laughs> I've got, um, yeah, I've got like one, like a good friend of mine and like, it's interesting, like one, one, like, so his, I think it was his grandfather or maybe the, the guy before him, but anyways, they ended up owning like a couple big buildings in like downtown Vancouver that are worth like hundreds of millions of dollars now, oh, but shit. they've just been, they've just been passed down. Like the rule in the family is like, nobody is allowed to sell the buildings. Um, so they just keep getting passed down. Um, but you know, this guy is like, he's just like, you know, he's a school teacher. Um, so he's got like this very wow. like humble job, Yeah, 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 yeah. you know, um, obviously he's teaching cause he enjoys it. Um, doesn't need the money, but like that, which is great. Me, yeah. Which is great. Like, you know, because, and he can, he can go and take that job because he doesn't necessarily have to worry about like, yeah. Building. Okay. That's great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, yeah. I mean, it's always. Yeah, it's hard to say how that it doesn't turn out that way for everybody. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I just want to uh, flip a little bit on. You're going to ask about you know a possible new investor coming to you in their 20s and in their 40s in a second. But I yeah. first want to ask you just about uh, real estate prices in Canada. Do you think over the short term interest rates can swing the prices? There's no doubt. I think you just shared a, a chart on your Twitter feed maybe a couple of days ago. 
about, I, I think it was about like real estate prices in different provinces and how, you know, yeah. how they're down over the last little bit. So short term for sure over medium and longer term. So let's say like five years, medium term and 10 years being longer term. I don't know if we just use that kind of frame. Um, and prices come down in a meaningful way, let's say 30% or greater, if we know that, or if we believe what we've been saying earlier, that the debasement of the dollar must continue. Like, can <laughs> we get a 30%? Because part of me, when, yeah. I, when I see a lot of like real estate bearers say, oh, real estate's overpriced, like just you guys wait, like it's going to come down. I could argue that debt gets so big that banks don't lend because the inflation threat is so strong that, you know, the whole bond market kind of gets a bit wobbly and banks just like begin freezing up the release of credit. And that could have a meaningful impact on real estate prices, no doubt. But then my mind goes to, oh, if that was ever to happen, the governments are going to step in and unfreeze that market by providing collateral and liquidity in some way or shape or form to the banking system. So in the medium term, so short term, maybe yes, but in the medium and longer term, I just don't see it. Otherwise, the whole system kind of collapses on itself. So yeah. I, like, do you think we could have like a 30, 35%, 40% correction in Canadian real estate? And I, again, I'm not trying to like corner you in and like, no, no, I like, gotcha. I just mean, hypoth just, you know, I, I 100% agree. I think that's, it, I definitely think that's a real possibility. I think it's a possibility in like a crisis type of event that was like clearly gets out of, out of the hands and out of the controls of the government, the Bank of Canada, the regulators and, and things go really far south quickly. So that's always a possibility, right? I mean, it happened in 2008 in many countries, but like, it's not even people like, well, why didn't it happen in Canada in 2008? And, you know, it's funny because everyone's like, ah, oh, because we got these great big five Canadian yeah, banks and they're so awesome. And like, they didn't take any risks. And I was like, well, that's that's not true. Um, what, what ended up happening is if you actually kind of look at it is basically the government um, started buying, they, they set up basically uh, programs to buy a lot of the bad debt off the Canadian banks and to allow them to continue to lend. So they, they instead of the Canadian banks freezing up like all these other banks, is they basically bought a lot of the, the bad mortgages off their books, allowed them to continue to lend um, to the point where you actually had like like noted economists in this country being like, hey, we're really worried about this program. Like you guys are buying a lot of our like bad <laughs> debt and, and like credit credit growth actually like accelerated in like 2009. Um, and then you kind of look like, basically, we yeah, so you get that 30, 35% correction or whatever. Like the, yeah, the solution is control alt print. Um, and so they're going to find a way, you know, we see all, we saw the goalposts move, right? Like during the pandemic, it's like, oh, don't worry about paying your mortgage for six months. You can just defer, you know, 18% of the mortgages in Canada were being deferred. You know, that's a pretty crazy concept. Who would have thought that was even a possibility two years ahead of time? Um and so that's number one. I think what you're seeing now is you're seeing, um, you know, these variable rate mortgages where banks are just letting people negatively amortize. I mean, mm -hmm. like, Wild. did anyone think that was even Wild. like a thing or a possibility no. or like, to me, that's like a default. That's just kind of like swept under the rugs. It's a, de it's a default. And like, you know, there's, there's shenanigans that are going on today with like, you know, pre-sale condos, right? Like think about how many pre-sales are like our, or like underwater, it's not worth what you paid for it three and a half years ago. You're closing. It's like, oh, well, we did a blanket appraisal on the project and we'll we'll still give you 80% of what you paid, even though it's worth, you know, 20% less. And it's like, well, that's a the fact that banks are underwriting those loans today is because the banks a lot of times are on the other side of that trade on the construction side they lent the developer the money to build the project and so they want all their buyers to close on the project so like this is the thing is yeah when you do have five canadian banks that effectively run the country you can pull off a lot of bs to kind of keep the, the ball rolling and so like my overarching thesis is like people get really angry and they get frustrated and say, this is, this is, this is bullshit. This shouldn't happen. Uh, but it's like, yeah, but like, what are you going to do about it? Like mm -hmm. it is what it is. And you have to kind of play the, the hand that you're dealt. And so it's like, yeah, I, I, that's how I look at it. And it's just like people, people like always are trying to be right. It's like, you don't have mm -hmm. to be necessarily right. Just make money. Like, mm -hmm. like not, let's be yeah, honest. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Stop Nine's, trying to be right. Just look at the game for what it is. 
people are yeah. trying to like outsmart it and outsmart the system and be right and like oh it's a ponzi it's gonna collapse it's like mm -hmm. yeah like but nine times out of ten like it pays to be on the long side because that's how the system is set up and so i think people like people that i find like that are like adverse to canadian real estate i'm I'm like i rent i don't own a home or like i don't believe in on the investment side it's usually for like moral reasons mm -hmm. it's just yeah. like they they think it's wrong right it's yeah. like, well house prices shouldn't be 12 times your income they should be four times your income and until they get back to four extra income i'm not buying real estate mm-hmm um, yeah, wild world. Um, okay. So a 20 year old comes to you now, they can invest anywhere in Canada, um, for cash flow and for, uh, you know, they, one of them tells you they want cash flow. One of them tells you they want max appreciation over the next 10 years. I'm just throwing shit against the wall here, Steve. So like, it's not totally thought out, but yeah. a 20 year old comes to you for max cash flow. They're like, I want in for cash flow. Where do they buy? And then the other 20 year old for appreciation in over 10 years or, or even longer, where do, where do they buy? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think it's a pretty easy answer for me. Uh, cash flow would go to Calgary. And Calgary. What, pro what property type in Calgary? Um, I mean, I don't like condos there, but if you're looking strictly for cash flow, I guess you're going into the condo market in Calgary, but like, why I don't was, you like why don't you like condos there? That's just a personal thing. Uh, I think thing. They, I think they have an ability to build a lot of new housing in Calgary. There's a lot of ability to expand and and it's just more of a free market so you can you can just build and they always every boom Calgary tends to overbuild. It um, seems like it. That's been my history watching Alberta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's boom and it is definitely boom and bust and so you can even look at today and like you know it's under construction right now. It's like it's it's really ramping up because like they just when things get hot yeah, money go, goes to work over there and, and is able to build quite freely. And so there's a lot more land to build there. You don't have the same land constraints. And okay. so like- So single, just, single family then in Calgary? Single family inner city is kind of where I personally play in and, and where I think there's actually some long-term appreciation as well. Um, but if you're looking strictly for cash flow, I, I suppose it's the Calgary condo market, even though, like I said, I would discourage most 20-year-olds from doing that. Um, appreciation. I think Vancouver single family detached. I think that's, I think it's a layup. Uh, um, because that's like the unicorn, like you just aren't going to find those going forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, there's like literally like you do not build new single family houses in the city of Vancouver period. End of story. So every single year, the, the, the supply of single family homes that are available on the market contracts every single year because they're being converted into duplexes, triplexes, townhouses, condos, high rises. Um, and so, you know, every single year we debase the currency, we add more people to the population here in Vancouver, and then the supply of the underlying product contracts. And so I think over a long enough time period, uh, I think people are going to make are still going to do quite well. Yeah. In that, in that. It feels like Vancouver's Ontario on steroids because we have the same thing in the greater Toronto. I think there's about 9 million people now from like Oshawa around the uh, Golden Horseshoe, like Lake Ontario to Niagara. Mm -hmm. um, and single family home building permits are dropping. Like they're, they're less than the level they were in the 90s, like back to the 80s, our new yeah. buildings. So we tell everyone, hey, if you can get a single family home here... <laughs> It's kind of like getting a unicorn because the population base is increasing. There's less of them being built and just the affordability of them is difficult. And they're being chopped up into legal duplexes or the lots are severed entirely. And it's like one single family is becoming four units with garden suites in the back. So it's becoming six. In Toronto, there's an architect that we're very familiar with, Craig Race. I don't know if you know Craig. Um, he has some of his clients are taking single family home lots dividing them, building two fourplexes on each lot and a laneway. So turning a one single, one old single family into 10 units, right? Two lots. So one lot into two lots, 10. Yeah. So the potential there is just kind of huge. So if you can get one of these things, to me, the future here is infill development. So if you can get a single family, you can do a lot of, a lot of things if you buy it. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's where Vancouver, BC in general is going. So we just passed like this multiplex zoning, which basically says any single family lot that's in British Columbia, um, if it's larger than 3000 square feet, which is like almost every lot, if the lot is larger than 3000 square feet, you must 
you must allow a minimum of four units to be built on that property. Mm. Um, and so that's just like the BC government has basically wiped out the zoning capacity from the municipalities and said, no, you must allow this. And so, yeah, I think that's just where the market is going, which is like housing realistically is not going to get much more affordable. And so they're going to try to solve this issue um, by basically adding density. And I think adding low rise ground up density is much easier to do, right? Like it's pretty easy to tear, tear down one house, build four row homes uh, than it is to tear down three houses and build a 40 story high rise. Cause then that stuff's expensive to build, right? The cost of concrete and labor and all that other stuff. It's pretty easy to build wood frame and you can do it easily, quickly, efficiently. Um, it's a huge, huge, huge product type in Calgary where they've had more lenient zoning for many, many years now. And I think BC is going to go that direction or hmm. they are going in that direction. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Are there any situations where you would tell someone uh, 40 years old or older or anyone, let me say any age that they should be selling their real estate right now? Or is it just like, it would be a unique case? Like in general, are there any reasons you would be telling someone? Um, God, I mean, the only thing I can think of is like, if you're over levered, right? yeah. if you're like, okay. just like, trimming down like your lifestyle where like you can't go on like vacations and like you got to go to the grocery store and watch what you're buying. Cause like your mortgage is like causing you financial stress. I mean, to me, that's an argument to be downsizing, yeah. taking some chips off the table. Yeah. We've seen a few investors like that and it's hard to tell people to sell. They don't generally yeah. want to hear and it, because it's hard to buy. It's hard to qualify. It's hard to get in. So if you've acquired the asset, they tend not, not to want to sell. But I've seen that where some people are over leveraged and we're telling them, hey, you probably should sell one of your properties. And it doesn't really go over as easily as I thought it might. So Yeah, we've yeah. seen people like I've had people that were like, again, this is not my philosophy. Everyone does their own thing. You know, you can give them the advice that you want. But, you know, um, is I've seen people like, take all their, you know, take their RSP, liquidate their TFSA, get some money from parents, dump it all into like one primary residence, single family house, have a huge mortgage that they're like, oh, this is kind of making us uncomfortable, but like we have to have a house. Like it's like to me that is stressful mm -hmm. and Agreed. I'm not even like in their shoes, right? It's like yeah. watching that, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of look at like your primary residence is like, I don't really look at it as like an asset. It is. And it isn't like, yes, you get the tax free save, you get the tax free benefit of it when you go to sell it in 20 years. Um, yes, you're building some equity, but at the end of the day, it's like you're servicing it, right? Like you're servicing that mortgage, you're paying the property taxes. Uh, you're paying for all the repairs, the maintenance. And, you know, and so I look at it and think like, I, I'm not a huge proponent of having massive overhead. I think mm -hmm. that you can take a lot more strategic debt on your investment properties, particularly if they're cash flowing and your tenants are servicing sure. all of that debt. But I'm not a huge proponent of like buying the biggest house that you can possibly, the banks will qualify you for and having a huge mortgage that causes you financial stress. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Steve. So with everything that you do, you know, you work with, you know, you're doing real estate transactions, you're putting out content, you're doing a, you know, popular podcast. How are you managing your schedule right now? Your family's growing. Yeah. Probably not that well. <laughs> yeah. Like, do you have a, but you have a process yet? Yeah, Cause you're, you're going to need one. I can see your future and you're doing yeah. a lot of stuff that's going to continue to uh, continue to like demand time from you. So right now you've just been able to handle it. There's no set schedule for content on a certain day that you're doing. Yeah, oh, uh, no, that's a good question. Um, I do schedule like most of my like life, like clients, everything gets booked. And like, if it's not in the calendar, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Uh, and so I do have set times for like our content. So like the Looney Hour, right? We record it every Thursday morning, 8.30 AM Vancouver time. Like that's just blocked off. Like, you know, the YouTube for my... YouTube show that gets put out every Saturday morning. They like that, that gets recorded every Friday afternoon. Right. So like, I don't take like client meetings like at Friday at four, between four and 5 PM. Like that's, that's the time where I dedicate to content. Cause like the biggest thing you hear from like people 
uh, in the industry or people are trying to produce content. Oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. It's like, well, you haven't prioritized it. You had just, you haven't set that time in your schedule. And it's like, if it's important to you, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll make the time. And so I look at it and say, I think it is important to me because I, at, at the end of the day, it's like, it's building my brand and it's building my business. And I look at it as like a, it's a marketing exercise. And so it has to be scheduled. What about your health and I don't know. So like, I don't know, fitness, nutrition, do you have any set things around those or no? Uh, I'm pretty, pretty, I have a pretty strict like routine. I'm a routine guy. Like I think you have to be like, if you're like working mm. a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I get to the gym 6 30 AM, uh, three, four times a week usually. And then yeah, come back, you know, you make your breakfast. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm usually like a good 30 minutes on Twitter in the morning just to see what's happening in the world. Get a few tweets out. There's my content for the day on Twitter. Yeah. If you're not following Steve on Twitter, you have to, because he's just, I don't know. I find some of your stuff just funny. Like you're talking data and housing, but I don't know. You do it in a manner that kind of just makes me, it's like entertaining somehow. I, I, don't also, I do like stirring the pot a bit. Okay. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know if your intent is that, but I don't know. Just sometimes I find myself just kind of laugh, like, yeah, just like nodding and laughing to myself, reading some of your tweets. Yeah. And now I have like, we have like, like some policymakers and like, I think people that are like actually like setting criteria and policy in Canada. And so I do feel like there's almost like a bit of responsibility now too to like to call yeah. out the BS or to to make uh, a comment. Yeah, like when you, yeah. especially like you know you guys probably see it all the time where you see some of these like housing policies that get introduced oh. or like or things that they don't introduce. You're like, man, this could be like an easy shoe in. Like, what are they doing? And like, so I love and to like comment in on that because I know I've got like a pretty deep base that will get behind me and support and and and, and mm -hmm. promote that message. Oh, cool. That's cool that you take on that responsibility because I think I look at stuff and I'll just kind of dismiss it. I'm like, oh, there's no hope. And I'll just maybe <laughs> uh, move on and not even comment. So I got to thank you then for taking on that role. Cause that's a pretty big responsibility. You're putting yourself out there commenting. You have an audience that's going to kind of support that. So I guess uh, I appreciate that you're doing that, Steve, and not what I'm doing, which is shrug my shoulder. Like I've kind of just been of the mindset, put blinders on, ignore politicians and yeah. just figure out the game and keep moving on and just well, you know. totally. I, 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 and I get it. I get it. There's definitely times where I'm just like, I just, I can't be involved in that conversation, but I feel like particularly on the housing front where it's like, I think I understand housing quite well. And yeah, I think I have yeah. a deep enough network of people that I, if I don't understand something oh, that well, I can easily ask them and get the right answers. And so I think there's, there's a responsibility to get that message out. I think that, you know, I've had people have been like, Oh, you know, you should get into like, you should get into politics. And I was mm -hmm. like, you know what? Like, yeah, I would never rule that out, but like, I think there's, I think I, ha I think you can actually in today's society, I think you can have a bigger impact on politics and on policies through social media and through being a content creator. I think creator. You, you might be right. And I feel like there's a bunch of you guys that are all about your age that are getting pretty influential in the country and you're smart and it kind of gives me a bit of hope. So I just want to thank you for what you're doing. So like the time you're taking on Twitter and taking some heat, maybe for putting some stuff out there, uh, there are people like me who are maybe a little bit more quiet that thank you for what you're doing. So seriously, no, I, like, I, I appreciate what you're doing and the content you're putting out, what you're doing with your YouTube videos, educating people, the Looney Hour podcast. Um, we wanted you to come out and speak at our event and you said, fuck it, no. So, and that was the response that we got back an email from Steve. Just F that I'm never coming out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, I uh, really, really wanted to be there. You guys are doing a great job. Obviously, uh, you know, I always appreciate you having me on here and, and, uh, the next, the next show, I'll definitely be out there. Just, this didn't work this year for family reasons, but, uh, yeah, I'm I'm out there. That so we'll make we'll make it happen next year. Yeah, yeah, no, we will. Yeah, and I'm just giving you a hard time. I'm just joking about that. But I I do want to thank you for everything you're doing because I think you resonate with a whole bunch of the population, and I think it's valuable. So I'm being completely sincere. I don't know if this is coming across a little cheesy or not, Steve. I apologize, but thank you no. um, for what you're doing. Seriously, it's appreciated. Yeah, no, yeah, you guys too, and you guys are obviously serving your audience and doing a great job of it. And and for those that are willing to listen, you're doing a you're doing a great service. Yeah.
Yeah, we're trying. But uh, cool. So on Twitter, is it probably the best place to find you? Is that the best place? Yeah, probably most active on Twitter at Steve Stretsky and then uh, YouTube. Uh, YouTube pretty active there because you can check out the uh, the Saturday real estate show and then we have the the Looney Hour which comes out every Friday. So so pretty, we'll pretty link active. we'll link to Steve's Twitter account, the YouTube channel, and the Looney Hour all in the show notes of this episode. If you're trying to track him down, um, Steve, thank you, man. I really uh, really appreciate you doing this. Thanks for taking the time, dude. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tom. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms. Your life, your terms.